Okay, guys. Now, in this part of the lecture, we'll talk a, a little bit about the physiology of blood pressure control. Again, we're not going to spend too much time discussing normal physiology. We'll cover this extensively in our physiology course, but it's nice to have just a little review um, of these mechanisms because they play a role in, in the pathology of hypertension, the pathophysiology of hypertension. So again, just remembering that you know, we've got our systolic or peak pressures, diastolic pressures, and again, um, as we move down in arterial tree, pressures typically get a little bit smaller, um, moving from our arteries to our arterioles, and then we're into the capillaries and venules and veins, right? Um, now, in terms of mechanisms, right, we'll go over the, some of the, the primary factors that influence blood pressure, and then we'll get into some of the, um, you know, the key equations to remember, which kind of drive a lot of these changes in blood pressure or control of blood pressure. So cardiac output being a big one, peripheral vascular resistance, volume of circulating blood, viscosity of vessels, and the elasticity of vessels, right? So if our heart's pumping a little bit harder, right, if we're, you know, we have our contractility has gone up, which in, influences cardiac output or the, you know, the ability for us to pump more volume out into the periphery, that's going to increase blood pressure. Heart rate will also affect this as well um, at, at a certain, you know, point of diminishing returns. Peripheral vascular resistance will also, you know, again, we'll, we'll go over that, why that's a, a main driving factor. If our vessels are more constricted, that's going to increase blood pressure. If they're more dilated, it's often going to decrease blood pressure. Uh, the volume made of circulating blood. So if you got, you know, a, you know, increased blood volume, like we're retaining volume in our um, vasculature, it's going to raise blood pressure. If the volume of circulating blood is lower, it's going to decrease blood pressure, right, because there's just not enough volume to create a pressure. The viscosity of blood, so if our blood's like really, really thick, it's gonna raise the pressure. And the elasticity of vessels, if our vessels are super stiff, right, that's also gonna affect um, our blood pressure and as well as the ability for us to perfuse tissues. So um, any, number of one of these, any number of these could be affected by a different condition, which can all influence blood pressure, right? And again, um, you know, the, the peripheral vascular resistance being a big part. So if you guys like this sort of reference here, you know, rest in peace, da you know, David Bowie and Freddie Mercury, you know, from their classic song, Under Pressure, you know, din, 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 din. All right. So key equations, again, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this. We, we, we've covered this already. But remembering this relationship between flow pressure and resistance. So if you go back to that concept of Ohm's law, remember Ohm's law, you know, is, you know, I think it's voltage or change in potential equals current times resistance, right? And we can make this doing a little bit of algebra, make this into current equals, you know, potential voltage over resistance, right? And this is analogous to the same exact question, uh, equation here where we've got, you know, Q, which is cardiac output, Q, I'm going to draw it out, Q equals driving pressure or change in pressure or delta P over resistance, capital R, okay? Um, of course, mean arterial pressure is analogous to, you know, cardiac output times resistance, and that's kind of how that relationship works with looking at, um, you know, cardiac output's influence on, on pressure. But if we look at this equation, this explains, we'll go delta P, if to keep, if you know, if we're to, if we're to keep cardiac output the same, right? The, you know, this is looking at the level of the heart, or this could also be done in terms of blood flow. If we're looking at the periphery in terms of peripheral blood flow in the, in the vessel, it's the same exact equation. If you know, to keep, you know, if we increase resistance, right? This goes up. To keep cardiac output or blood flow the same driving pressure must also increase. And conversely, if driving or if um, vascular resistance goes down, the pressure needed or the driving pressure needed to maintain cardiac output also decreases, right? So you don't have to work as hard. Um, or it may actually improve blood flow if we have a little bit less resistance, right? 
we need less driving pressure, but maybe you know, if we want to actually increase it, we could, we could either you know increase driving pressure or decrease the resistance. And again, if we you know, the, the name of the game is when we're looking at hypertension, if we see an increase in resistance, pressure has to increase to keep cardiac output consistent, as well as you know looking at blood flow in the periphery to keep blood flow the same. We need a higher driving pressure, and this is really where blood vessel resistance can really make the heart have to work harder because we have to create more pressure to pump blood out of the heart. Now, um, you know, and that can be problematic because it can cause the heart to have to remodel, get thicker, right? So we'll get into that later on. But again, remember this key concept. Now, when we look at factors that contribute to blood or vessel resistance, vessel radius is probably one of the strongest factors, it's actually by a factor of four. And we look at this equation here from Basilia's Law that, you know, it's on the denominator, vessel radius, right? And it increases things by a factor of four. So if we increase the radius, right, it will decrease resistance, right? Because it's on the denominator, it'll make this value smaller. It'll decrease resistance by a factor of four. So resistance will decrease, right? As vessel radius, as the vessel gets wider or dilates, resistance decreases. And conversely, let's get our little, our little uh, eraser. If this vessel radius decreases, right, if the vessel gets constricted, vessel radius here, again, if this decreases, it will, because again, it's on the denominator, this value gets larger resistance will increase by a factor of four. So again, just remembering, if we go looking at our vessel here, vessel here, and we go from a vessel radius, this, this size to a vessel radius, and these aren't, these aren't drawn to scale, obviously, guys. But if we go from a vessel radius from that side to our vessel radius of this side, right, we're going to have, again, it's going to make it harder for flow to move through that vessel. Um, so we have to increase the pressure, the driving pressure, um, to keep flow consistent. You know, So again, this is one of the reasons how vascular resistance and vascular diameter, right, looking at vasodilating, vasoconstricting factors, dictate blood pressure. And often why a lot of our medications are geared towards improving vasodilation, or at least reducing constriction. And then looking at regulatory systems, We've got you know our two primary ones, fast and slow, and then within there we've got some subgroupings. So our baroreceptors are really geared to uh, respond to uh, sudden changes in blood pressure. That a, it's a neuromediated um, reflex, right? You know, with sensors in the aortic arch and carotid sinuses. Um, it's really important, especially for maintaining blood perfusion pressure and blood flow, um, most notably in response to position changes. Um, so our baroreceptor is really important for sudden changes, quick changes in, in blood pressure, right, to keep things consistent. We have also our slow adapting systems, like our RAS system or RAS system, because it's technically renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone systems. You might see this as R-A-A-S. It's the same exact thing. Um, this is mediated through the kidneys. Same thing, looking at blood flow through it, but it's a slower adapting system. We'll review these just briefly, but these are also, uh, you know, you know these, these, these systems here, the baroreceptor and the RAS system, two primary uh, systems um, for, you know, our negative feedback loops to keep blood pressure within that, that set range that we have for our body, our homeostatic set range, which again, that's all a physiology really is. You know, keep, you know, the systems that keep us at a homeostatic set point. And then we have our natriuretic peptides, We'll talk more about these in our uh, heart failure lecture. These are kind of act to counteract the RAS system. They're released by the heart, um, either in the atria or the ventricles well, for, for BNP. Um, in response to stretch, they basically do the exact opposite of you know, angiotensin II. Um, but we'll talk more about that in the heart failure lecture. It's a little bit more relevant in, in, that, in that content area. So again, quick review of the uh, baroreflex, so again, these operate through a negative feedback loop. So if we have decreased arterial pressure, right, so they respond basically to stretch, right, in, in our vessels. So if there's less stretch because there's less pressure, you know, pushing against the vessels, 
the firing rate of the baroreceptors will decrease, which will increase sympathetic activity, um, decrease vagal activity, right? Remember, because our vagus nerve is kind of pumping the brakes on the heart at rest, it'll decrease that, ramp up sympathetic activity, which will increase cardiac output, increase uh, uh, vascular resistance to then bring pressure back up. And then conversely, if pressure is too high, if pressure increases, uh, it will increase baroreceptor firing, which will increase vagal activity, decrease uh, sympathetic activity, and then you know, do the opposite. So it's, it operates by keeping things controlled at that set point. And it's, it's all in response to um, stretch, you know, uh, the stretch receptors in those vessels um, that trigger this reflex. Again, it operates through a negative feedback loop. Now, why this is important, again, they, they really fire or they operate on a, a, um, a point of maximum sensitivity. And what can be problematic is in patients with chronic hypertension, that range for which your baroreceptors respond, right, um, shifts to the right. So, you know, you and I, you know, we might respond, right, to a, um, you know, changes in pressure, you know, um, based on the set point of 100. Well, if you have chronic hypertension, right, those nerves in the barrow, you know, reflex, those baroreceptors are going to be, you know, more accustomed to higher pressure. So we shift things to the right, um, because that's kind of what our body's set point is at more often. Why this can be problematic is quite often in patients with hypertension, we get the medications, which lowers their blood pressure. However, their baroreflex receptors are kind of used to this higher set point. So they aren't as responsive to sudden changes in pressure, most notably when we stand and pressure drops a little bit because of the pooling of blood and so on and so forth, the hydrostatic pressure differences. Um, and those baroreceptors take a little bit longer to respond because again, they're used to being here and now our pressure is here and actually maybe a little bit lower. So it takes a little bit longer for them to respond, um, which is one of the reasons why a lot of patients stop taking their medications because they get dizzy because their bare receptors take a little bit longer to adapt. Now this will happen, they'll gradually get used to that new set point eventually and exercise can help with that. But understanding how these uh, bare receptors and the bare reflex contribute to, to these symptoms and to this process is really important. Um, as you know, as we'll get into in, in other, other situations. So uh, the other uh, process, again, is our RAS system. Again, it's an enzyme that's released into circulation by the kidneys. Uh, it's stimulated primarily by renal artery hypotension or low blood flow through the kidneys. And again, you've seen this graph here. So if we've got, um, you know, at our, um, at our kidneys, right, if we have decreased renal perfusion of the jugular ap apparatus, the kidneys secrete renin, right? Renin interacts with um, angiotensinogen, which converts into angiotensin one when it interacts with renin. Angiotensin one, when it travels, when blood travels through the lungs, interacts with ACE, which is located in the endothelium of the, the vasculature in the lungs, as well as the kidneys too, but primarily in the lungs, which converts angiotensin one, which again, which was created from you know, being released from the liver and interacting with renin, which was released from the kidneys, converts angiotensin one. ACE converts angiotensin one into angiotensin two. So we go renin released from the kidneys due to low perfusion, interacts with angiotensin, which is released by the liver. That converts to angiotensin one. Angiotensin one when it passes through the lungs and the kidneys, the endothelium in those blood vessels and those vasculature or vascular beds, convert angiotensin one through angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE to angiotensin two, and then angiotensin two has those profound effects on sympathetic activity, absorption, which helps us maintain blood volume, vasoconstriction, um, you know, decreasing. Um, or sorry, increasing ADH secretion. So we hold on to more volume, right? Antidiuretic uh, hormone. So we see, you know, profound effects from the RAS system. And sometimes this can be a little bit out of order. Uh, but again, it shows you again, that one of the, this, this slow adapting system for maintaining blood pressure. Now, probably what's the most 
most concerning thing to remember, and this is why hypertension can be lethal, especially lethal acutely, that remembering this autoregulation curve that um, you know, we see with every organ that has high metabolic activity, brain, the kidneys have this, even your muscles have it. Uh, the brain is probably the most notable one because it has uh, probably one of the highest amounts of blood flow going to it. And um, it uh, has a very you know, well-studied uh, autoregulation curve. Now, autoregulation is the ability of an artery in an end organ system, right, like the brain, to maintain um, blood flow at a consistent rate to it. And these respond, right, if you see a pressure range of about 60 to 140, mean pressure, right? It's able to keep things pretty consistent. So if things, you know, drop too low, you know, if pressure drops too low, we'll see the vessels dilate a little bit to get more flow into the brain. If the pressure gets a little bit too high, right, we're, the, we're running a little bit too hot here, you know, we're getting a little bit um, too much flow, right? Um, the vessels will constrict, right, to keep blood flow consistent. So again, if our, if our pressure starts to bottom out a little bit, we start moving beyond that normal mean pressure of about 100, right? We start moving to you know, the 60s, we start getting close to cardiogenic shock. Um, but again, we, if we start dropping below 100, the blood vessels will dilate to keep cerebral blood flow consistent around that 50. You know, if it gets too high, right, it goes beyond that normal 100, we'll start seeing it constrict again, to keep blood flow fairly consistent, you know, in the brain. What's concerning, and well, if blood pressure gets too low, we actually lose the ability, right, that regulatory system plummets when we start seeing blood flow drop. This is when we start seeing, you know, cardiogenic shock. That's why it corresponds typically for most people to a mean pressure of about 60, uh, because, you know, that autoregulatory capacity is, is within that range. Now, if we go above 140, and why this gets really concerning for hypertension crisis and emergencies, to go beyond 140, again, we're at these ranges, there's a lot of kinetic energy, a lot of energy coming to those smaller capillaries. And normally they would be able to constrict to kind of shut the dam a little bit, right? To reduce the amount of flow, high pressurized, pulsed high flow coming into the small capillaries, which we call damage. We get to a point, right, that it gets, it's so high, we lose that ability, and we start seeing those end organs get flooded with pressure, right? And this is why we can see hypertensive, um, you know, um, uh, and uh, encephalopathy, so, you know, bleeding basically in the brain, damage to the brain. We can see, you know, acute changes to the kidneys. People start uh, having, you know, hematuria and, and urinating blood because uh, the small capillaries in the kidneys start to get damaged because they, we don't have the ability to, to clamp down, right, to prevent high pulsatile flow from coming into the small capillary systems, um, you know, which can cause damage to those organs. So this is why hypertension, especially at critical values, can, can be really, really damaging. Um, so in the next section, we'll get into classifications, but I hope this was a nice little reminder of physiology and, again, why hypertension or elevated blood pressures can be so concerning.